Good. All right. I'd like you, if you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke and to chapter 15, very well-known chapter. And I want to just read from verse 11 down to verse 24, but we will think about the whole chapter together in our time together. And so Luke 15, verse 11, it says, and he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to live uh, to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry and then please just one other scripture and you can keep your finger in luke uh, 15 because we're going to come back there but luke's gospel chapter 19 and verse 10 which i believe is the key verse really in the gospel of luke and it simply says this luke 19 verse 10 for the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is was lost. I always pray uh, that the Lord will confirm uh, the ministry uh, that the uh, Lord has put on my heart as I would speak. And it was interesting, yesterday morning I was reading a, a daily devotional, and the reading for that day was about Moody and Sankey, and about how uh, Moody and Sankey were uh, had just finished a crusade in Glasgow, Scotland, and they were on their way to Edinburgh. And on the train uh, going to Edinburgh, Sankey had got a newspaper, and of course, very different to the newspapers of today, in it was a poem. And that poem was called The Ninety and the Nine. And when he got to the crusade, they began the first crusade, and Moody asked him if he would uh, give him a song. And so Mr. Sankey sat down at the piano. He had never uh, written a tune before for this, but this, this poem was very much on his heart. And he began to play a tune that he felt would fit with this song, The Ninety and the Nine. And I want to just read uh, one line of it, uh, of the song, The Ninety and the Nine, because again, it was a real confirmation to my heart in the direction that I should go this morning. It says, Lord, thou hast here the ninety and nine. Are they not enough for thee? But the shepherd made answer, this of mine has wandered away from me. And although the road be rough and steep, I go to the desert to find my sheep. And there's much more in that beautiful song, but it was really a confirmation in my own heart. And then this morning at the Lord's Supper, uh, just to kind of confirm even further, uh, Brother Ed Gazinski, uh, he gave out this uh, number 33. And again, just want to read one line of it. Once as prodigals, we wandered in our folly far from thee, but thy grace or sin abounding rescued us from misery. Thou thy prodigals has pardoned, kissed us with a father's love, welcomed us with joy overflowing, even 
to dwell with thee above. So I have great confirmation that what I'm speaking on this morning is the message that God wants me to speak on. And normally, when we think of this particular passage that I just read, we tend to call it the prodigal son. But I want to maybe disagree with the conventional approach. And I want to suggest to you that this chapter in Luke chapter 15 is not about the prodigal son, but actually the entire chapter is about the God of prodigals. And the emphasis is not so much on the son, but it's on the God who loves the wayward and goes out of his way to reach them. And so the context is very crucial uh, about any passage of scripture. So I want us to just see what the original context is. We're going to begin in verse one, and then we're going to kind of work our way through a little bit of this chapter together. So in verse one, notice it says, Luke 15, verse one, then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured saying, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Because that's their scolding accusation. But, oh, what a wonderful message that is to, to, to us. Aren't we glad that this man, Jesus, receives sinners and eats with them? Because where would any of us be? Because we're all sinners, and we know we are by, by nature and by choice. And yet we've been received as a result of the work of the Good Shepherd. But the, it's kind of interesting how it gives us a little window into the mentality of the scribes and the Pharisees, doesn't it? Because they obviously did not see themselves as sinners. This man receiveth sinners and eateth with him, speaking of the publicans and sinners, as if like we're, we're not like them. And their problem was they had great heart of self-righteousness and they didn't see themselves the way god sees them at all but it's interesting how the common people the bible says received the lord jesus gladly and part of the reason why they appreciated him so much was he spoke with authority not like the scribes and the, and the pharisees and they were envious of him and they murmured uh, because uh, the the crowds were going after him they could see that he was different and so they accused him of receiving sinners and eating with them. And the main point of the chapter is to really show the difference between how God in heaven views things and how man on earth views things, especially religious man. Religious man views it in one way, but God in heaven sees things in a very different way. And so we're going to see that as we go. Notice verse 3. And this is a key verse, by the way, verse three, it says, he spake this parable unto them saying, now I want you to notice it's a, this, this parable is singular. It's not three parables. We often talk about, uh, you know, the parable of uh, the, the uh, shepherd going after the the sheep that had gone astray. And then we talk about the parable uh, of the, uh, the woman that lost that coin. And uh, she, she had 10, but one of them was lost and she searched the house till she found it. And then we talk about the, the parable of the, uh, the, the lost son. And yet, clearly, this is one parable, singular. He spake this parable unto them. And this one parable is primarily addressed to the, the Pharisees and scribes in their self-righteousness. And so it's, it's aimed at them, but it's a parable, and it's a parable in three distinct movements. One parable, three distinct movements. And of course, the theme of the parable is the heart of God, as opposed to the self-righteousness of the Pharisees. And so I want to just break down these three movements just kind of briefly. And the first movement is, we might title this, the shepherd suffering. And it's, it's a picture of the son of God, the one who is the good shepherd, who gave his life for the sheep. And so here's a picture of a, a shepherd. Uh, and he's suffering because he, although he has a hundred sheep, one of them has gone astray. And he leaves the 90 and the 9, and he goes after the one sheep that had gone astray. And as we would see, if we had time to look at it, we'll see that that sheep is helplessly lost. 
He's a helplessly lost sheep. He's, he's in a position where sheep are pretty helpless characters, really. Uh, they, they fall on their back. They can't get up again. It, somebody has to put them back up again. They're, they're just very uh, high maintenance creatures that are pretty helpless. And so here's the picture of a, somebody who is helplessly lost and the shepherd goes after the one who is helplessly lost. Second movement is uh, given to us uh, from verse 8 down to verse 10. And we, we won't make any comment on it yet. Let's think about the third movement, and then we'll come back to the second movement. Third movement, uh, basically, uh, <clears throat> movement number three is the one we read from verse 11 right to the end of the chapter, verse 32. And we might call that one the father sprinting. <laughs> uh, we saw the shepherd suffering, uh, the final movement is the father sprinting, and it, we see the father running to receive the prodigal back, and it's the only picture in scripture of God ever being in a hurry, God the father sprinting to welcome back uh, the, uh, the prodigal son that had gone astray, and so the father sprinting, and it's clearly a picture of the heavenly father and his heart for the lost. Now, if the first movement would speak to us of the son, and he's the shepherd that's going after the sheep that have gone astray. And the last movement would tell us about the heart of the father sprinting to receive the prodigal. Who do you think might the middle section, the middle movement be about? I want to suggest to you that it's the work of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to explain why in a moment, but I wanted to just kind of get the scene first. And so verse eight, either what woman having 10 pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, does not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligent till, till she find it. And when she has found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together saying, rejoice with thee, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say to you, there's joy in the presence of angels over one sinner that repents. Now, you might say, Mike, I think you're stretching it a bit here because this is a woman. Well, yes, I know it's a woman. I've read the passage. I'm very well aware of that. But I want to suggest to you that the Holy Spirit is working today in going after the lost. And he's, he's using the church, which is... The, the ultimate bride of Christ, and he's using the church, using, notice this woman, she's got, uh, she, she's lit a candle, <laughs> and, she, and so the Bible, it tells us concerning the word of God, that, that it's a light to our feet, and a, a lamp, to, lamp to our feet, a light to our path, and I want to suggest to you that the picture is the spirit of God using the word of God through the church to reach out to lost sinners, and so in this movement number two, the woman seeking, seeking, picture the Holy Spirit, his activity through the church, the woman using light to find those who are lost in the darkness. And again, this coin that is lost is unconsciously lost. In other words, a coin has no awareness, right? I mean, it's just a coin. And so it, it doesn't even realize it's lost. And there are people out there today that have no consciousness of their lost condition. And it's only when through the, the church, the spirit of God reaches out in evangelistic fervor using the word of God, that it can possibly cause somebody who doesn't even realize they're lost to see their lost condition. And so the coin is un, unconsciously lost. By the way, this coin, uh, uh, coins, two aspects of this coin. First of all, coins usually bore an image usually of the emperor or whoever, uh, just like uh, you have George Washington on your quarters and back in the UK, we've got the queen on our coins. And so, uh, of course, it's the image usually of some significant person. And again, in this case, I would suggest to you that what is lost and that God through the spirit is seeking for through the church are people who were made bearing the image and likeness of God, but they've gone astray. And the spirit through the word is seeking to reach them and win them back to the Lord. And so unconsciously lost. And then the, the, the third movement, which we read about the prodigal son, he, he's, if the sheep were helplessly lost and the coin was unconsciously lost, I want to suggest to you the son is willfully lost. 
You see, he left the father's house. He knew what the father's house was all like about. Uh, he, he, and he willfully left it uh, because he wanted to pursue his own goals and ends. The common theme is something lost and something valuable. Lost sheep, lost silver, lost son. And in each case, the things that are lost are restored, and the result is joy in every case. And of course, the big picture is this. There's joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. And we see this like a refrain run, running through this, this singular parable in three movements, but there's kind of like a, uh, just like some of our hymns, there's a refrain, and that refrain is joy at the recovery of that which was lost. So verse seven, I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over 90 and nine just persons which need no repentance. Uh, again, it says in verse 10, likewise I say to you, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And then finally, verse 32, it is meet that we should make merry and be glad for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. And so it's evident that the big point that is being conveyed in this chapter is the value of the sinner to God. The very people, the Pharisees, or self-righteous scribes and religionists of the day, look down upon. God says, these are valuable to me. They're, they're precious to me. And I, God Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, we three in one, we will work until we have recovered that which was lost. And when we have recovered that which was lost, there will be great rejoicing in heaven. What amazing labor and trouble divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will take to bring sinners to repentance. God has lost him, and he wants him recovered and restored. And so just keep that in mind. Now, as we go through, uh, we're going to look primarily at the third movement, but we will comment on the others uh, as they relate to this third movement. But I'm going to kind of divide up this, this third movement uh, into sections. And uh, we're going to bring it, begin with the first section, which is, I'm going to just title Rebellion. And I'm going to give the letter R just to kind of give consistency through these various sections. And so it says, a certain man had two sons. And of course, you notice how it, it goes down. The, the first one is one in 100, one in 100 sheep lost. The second one is one in 10. A woman had 10 coins. One of them was lost. And now it's one in two. And in each case, it doesn't matter uh, whether it's one or it's 100 lost. The Lord wants them back. And we just see something of his heart. So we see the rebellion here. It says in verse 12 of these two sons, the younger of them said to his father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto him his living. And so we often call this one the prodigal. We'll see why we, we use that term. Uh, but he leaves a place of privilege. He's in the father's house, and he turns away from everything that he has known, and he basically wants his own way. This is Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've everyone turned his own way. And certainly this willful uh, sinner uh, wants out. He doesn't want to be under the restraint of the father's house. He wants the blessings. Oh, yeah, he wants all the blessings. Give me the inheritance. I want all the blessings. But he doesn't want to be under the father's authority and in his house. He wants to get away, do his own thing. Maybe even this morning, there's, there's somebody, actually, you're still in the father's house. You're still in your father's house, as it were. But in your heart, you're already thinking, I can't wait to get away. I can't wait to spread my wings. I can't wait to do my own thing. I may be here. You may be there in presence this morning, but in your heart, you're already planning your escape. Well, I, I, this is a warning passage for anybody who would be thinking that way this morning. And it's kind of a tragic thing. Is he saying to his father, I wish you were dead? Because he wants the inheritance. <laughs> you don't usually get the inheritance while the father's alive. 
And, and, is, and is he saying, I, I just can't stand being here. I wish you were dead. I want all that's coming to me so I can get out from under your authority. And, and he is certainly somebody who is rebellious. And of course, there's a, a certain sense in which uh, some people run further into riot than others. But if we've turned our backs on God, we're equally, utterly wicked. And this is what this man wants to do. He wants to get out of the father's house. And notice it says, he gets the portion, uh, and it says in verse 13, not many days after the youngest son gathered all together, took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Now, this word wasted is where we get our word prodigal. And the idea of the word prodigal means the, the, the inability to save. It's somebody who is just wasteful. It's like, uh, I hate to say this, but our government is prodigal. It, it's not only spending what it has, it's spending what it doesn't have, right? It's spending our future retirement and, and everything else. It's totally prodigal. It cannot save. It doesn't understand that mentality. It is totally prodigal. Well, uh, this is not a talk on government and all the rest of it, but it, but it gives you the idea of what the idea is. Somebody who's wasting his substance. And what is he wasting on? Well, riotous living. Uh, he's living it up. He's He's out there uh, doing his thing, so to speak. And, he's, he's, he, and of course, what it tells us is uh, sin is very expensive. He got a good inheritance, and in pretty short time, it's all gone. And the reason for that is the high price of sin. Sin is very expensive. It costs more than you want to pay, and it will take you further than you want to go. And, and it really is expensive. But why is sin so expensive? Well, it's called the law of diminishing returns. This is what's wrong with sin. And so the idea is this. So somebody that maybe takes a drink, their first drink, and, and maybe they get a buzz. And then the next time they, they want that same buzz, but they have to drink more because the body gets used to it to get the same effect. And eventually they have to drink more and more and more to get the same effect because sin has built within it. God built it within the law of diminishing returns. Uh, somebody gets involved in pornography. And I want to suggest to you that he starts out with pretty tame stuff, but, but that doesn't satisfy after a while to get the same buzz, he's got to go deeper. And so he gets into more and more perverse things because, because sin is very expensive because it doesn't ultimately give temporary pleasure, but it can never give lasting satisfaction. And it draws people deeper and deeper and deeper into slavery and in a wasted life. And so here he is, uh, he's wasted his substance with riotous living. And verse 14, when he had spent all, it's all gone, nothing left. There arose a mighty famine in the land. And I want to suggest to you that a country far from God is a land of famine. Because the world can't satisfy, and you go, turn your back on God, you, you're, you're going to spiritually dry up. Because this world, Jan Darby used to say, is a wilderness wide, and it cannot satisfy. And so he, what is he going to do now? He's, all his money's gone. He's in a far country. There's a famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And tragically, how many prodigals end up? in the gutter, far, far away from where they grew up, a place of privilege and in a terrible state and terrible need. And it says, <clears throat> he went, verse 15, and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him to his fields to feed the swine. And so he, he basically ends up doing for a stranger that he would never have done in his father's house. <laughs> he, he ends up uh, feeding the pigs. This is his responsibility. And again, uh, we could just suggest that, that all the world has to offer is swine food, pig food. Uh, it really doesn't satisfy the heart of man. And so he lives like an animal. Uh, he's tempted to eat it. He said he would fain have filled his belly uh, with the husks and the swine did eat and no man gave unto him. And so he basically uh, was so desperate, he wanted to eat the food that the pigs were eating. And sometimes we, we try and 
help our prodigals out and we try and protect them and we try and prevent them from getting to the place where they'll come to the end of themselves. And it's a natural reaction. We, we love them. We want to be protective of them. We, 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 we have that natural instinct. But sometimes we have to let them go and let them fail. And it's only then that they'll come to themselves when they really realize the predicament they're in. And notice it says in verse 17, and when he came to himself, isn't that gracious of God? What God is saying is, he really wasn't himself. When he was doing all this, when he was living that way, he really wasn't himself. And that's what God wants from us, to, to really come to ourselves, to come to the realization of where we are. And so the true self of man was reached when he came to judge himself and recognize that there was an abundance of satisfaction still in the father's house. Notice it says, when he came to himself, he said, how many higher servants of my father's have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger. Isn't that amazing? That even though he's run as far away as he can from the father's house, he, he hasn't forgotten the father's house. He still is able to recall that even the servants in his father's house were better off than he was right now. And so when he was... In the father's house, he was sick of home, and now he's out uh, eating pig food in a strange land. All of a sudden, he's not sick of home, he's homesick. And he thought, oh, if I could only be a, a, a servant in my father's house, I'd be better off than I am now. And so it says he came to himself, and he really hadn't been himself because there's a certain insanity to sin. And I hope we realize that, that it is insane to sin. It really is. It's, you're not yourself. It's not what God intended for you. You were, you were made in the image and likeness of God, and you were meant to glorify him forever. And when you're involved, enslaved in sin, there's a certain insanity to the whole thing. One of the, one of the aspects of the insanity is that you think that you can do what others have done, and you can get away with it. When the Bible is clear, the way of the transgressor is hard, and be sure your sin will find you out. But the insanity of sin is that I can do it, and I'll get away with it. I'm going to live a charmed life. And so he came to himself. He said, how many hired servants of my father have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger. And so he's coming to a place of recognition of his perilous condition. And what is it that's brought him to this place? I want to suggest to you that it's the goodness of God that has brought him to repentance. He remembers the father's house and he remembers it was different there. And could I say even the goodness of God has allowed him to fail, to bring him to the end of himself so that he'll turn and come back to the father's house. But really, even though he's come to this in his mind that the father's house is the best place, it's not going to do him any good until he does what is found in verse 18. He says, I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Now, one of the reasons that I mentioned to you that this is really not the story of the prodigal son, but it's the story of the God of prodigals is because the father is mentioned in verse 11 to the end of the chapter 12 times, but the, the son is only mentioned six times, twice as much mention of the father than there is of the son. And that's the emphasis that the Holy Spirit wants us to get, that this is actually a, a, a definite work of the father in seeking the lost son. So he, he comes to the end of himself, and then he makes this resolve. I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And it's only when he does this that there's a real possibility of change. Because man is made up of three parts, right? He's made up of a, 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 a mind, an emotion, and a will. And in his mind, he's already thinking the father's house is a better place. In his emotion, I'm sure that he's emotionally wrecked 
uh, there he is in this terrible plight, but it's only when he activates the will and says, I will arise and go to my father, is there any hope for forgiveness and restoration? And so he says, I will arise and go to my father. And then he rehearses what he's going to say. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation. Sometimes when I was younger, I'd get into trouble at home. And uh, my mother would say, wait till your father gets home. And so I would be rehearsing my speech of what I was going to say, how I was going to try and put a positive spin on this, you know, so I'd be thinking, well, I'm going to say this, this, and this. Well, this is exactly what he does. And he had plenty of time to rehearse because remember, it's a, it's a far country. So it's a long journey to make backwards. And so <laughs> perhaps another thing I'll say before we, we enter into this lengthy journey back where he's rehearsing what he's going to say to his father. I want you to just think a little bit about not only the prodigal suffering, which is where our focus often is, but I want us to think of the father's suffering. You know, when we go in this course of sin and rebellion, how heartbreaking it is for the father in heaven. And how heartbreaking it is for human fathers when their children willfully reject the heritage that their parents want to give to them. And, you know, sin really does devastate on multi-levels, not just the person involved in it, but their family members are also devastated. And so we often think of the suffering of the wayward son, but we don't think about the suffering of the father. And we're going to get a glimpse in this section, which talks about the reception. Now, we've talked about rebellion. We want to think of reception, the reception that the father will give. And so he's planning what he's going to say. He's making this journey back. And how different? Can you see the contrast? The outbound journey, he's got all this money in his pocket. He's probably dressed in his finest robes. And he's elated about what he's going to do. On the way back, he's making the very same journey. But this time, he's hungry. He has no food. He's nowhere to go and get get uh, a night at a B and B on the way back or at a hotel. Uh, he, he's probably in rags. He stinks of the of the pig pen, and and how humiliating! What a different scene the return journey is. And yet he makes this journey back, and he is going over in his mind what he's going to say to his father. I've sinned against heaven. And before thee, I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Verse 19, make me as one of thy hired servants. Father, just let me back in as a servant. I'd be happy to do that because I know I'll be better off than I, where I was. And so it says he arose and came to his father. But here we look at the reception. I want you to notice what it says. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. Do you think that was just by chance that the father saw him when he was a great way off? Or, or was it, as I imagine it, that every single day that the son was gone, the father would come to his front porch and he'd scan the horizon, looking, longing for the return of his wayward son. And so perhaps his eyes had grown weary in the watching, he was waiting. Maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm speaking to a prodigal this morning. And I want to tell you, the father's waiting. He's just waiting for you to arise and come to your senses and come back to the father's house. And he is ready to receive you. How ready is he to receive you? Well, notice it says, again, in our passage, uh, it says <clears throat> in verse 20, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. The very thing, by the way, the scribes and the Pharisees had zero compassion. But he had compassion. And then it says this, he ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And so we have this amazing picture. It's the only picture in the Bible that I know of that, that shows God in a hurry. Because throughout scripture, there seems to be a, a, like a divine leisureliness about things. Uh, he, he's not in a rush. Uh, we, we talk about the coming of Christ, the fullness of time God sent forth his son, but that was 
four millennia since the promise of the seed of the woman. Four thousand years had passed. God is not in a rush. And yet here is the only instance that we know of in scripture where you have God in a hurry. And it says he ran and he fell on his neck, it says, and kissed him. And the, the language, the original, is not just that he kissed him. The Greek has the idea he smothered him with kisses. And so the son, now he's been practicing this speech for many days. And so it says, the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. By the way, isn't it good to get honest and confess that our sin is not just against our family, but it's against heaven, it's against God that we've sinned and him only we've sinned against. And it's good to get to that place of being honest before God and confessing it. And he does that. And, and yet the rest of the speech uh, about, I wanna be you know, kind of your hired servant, he can't seem to get it out because before he even can get that far, and I, I reckon he was speech was smothered with kisses and, and he's just in such an embrace from his father that he can't get the rest of the sentence out. Uh, but he's never able to say, uh, I'm no more worthy to be called your son, maybe one of your hired servants. And so it says, the father said, before the son could even say all that, the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. And so the father, he gives him a new jacket uh, which would speak of a new righteousness. Uh, his old clothes stunk. His old clothes spoke of sin and degradation. And the father gets the best robe and puts it on him. And we were once in filthy rags. All we like, we were in these filthy rags. And God has clothed us with garments of salvation. We're covered with a new righteousness. And a new uh, a ring was put on his finger. It's a new relationship. He's no longer a, a, a servant, but he's a son. And with a son, he's got a ring that gives uh, the, that place of, of authority in the family. And, and new shoes, he's got a new walk. No longer the jaded walk of a man who had been brought to his, the end of himself, but he has got a new walk altogether. One that is willing to please his father in this new position. And so the question you might ask is, well, this son has done a lot of dishonor to his father. Really a lot of dishonor. He does, dishonored his father's reputation to, to leave the house, was saying the house is bad. And so how, how could this be done to him when he's, he's clearly a rebel? Well, remember we said this is one parable in three movements. And it's because the good shepherd gave his life for the sheep that this prodigal can be restored. God sent his own son out of heaven. And he, he who knew no sin was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so he's now clothed in a new righteousness that is one to him. Uh, for him through the work of the the good shepherd that gave his life for the sheep and so here he is now delivered accepted free and he looked resplendent along with his father and we'd have to say this love is patient and is kind and oh how we see the kindness of god in all of this well now we move on to another little section in that section is one of resentment. I want you to notice from verse 25 onwards, it says, now his elder son was in the field and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing and he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, thy brother is come and thy father hath killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and he would not go in Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And so we see there's this, this angry older brother who just doesn't, he's not, you know, he might not have gone away to the father's, uh, left the father's house, 
but he's certainly, uh, maybe even being outwardly compliant, but he's entirely out of sympathy with the heart of his father. He doesn't get the heart of God. He's just like the scribes and the Pharisees in the story. Self-righteous, no understanding of grace and mercy, and just a resentful son, outwardly compliant, yet not in sympathy with his father, does not get the heart of God at all. And he's the only joyless person in this whole story. And it is interesting, isn't it, that self-righteous people are the most joyless people on planet earth <laughs> they really are they don't love god they do not love the, uh, like they ought to they do not love their neighbor as their self and they basically look down on others and there's an arrogance about them and so we see this in this elder son this self-righteousness and then we notice the father remonstrates with him. And again, we've got another R here, the father remonstrating with this, this son. Uh, and he, he says to him, uh, <clears throat> verse 28, he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lord, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time his commandments, and yet thou never gavest me a kid, and I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which has devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said to him, and here's the remonstration of his father, son, thou art ever with me, and all that, all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. And he wants him to somehow understand something of his own heart toward his lost son and the fact that he's returned. But you know what's amazing about this story is that there's actually a third son in this story. You see, we've, we've heard about the, the wasteful son, and then we've heard about this son who stayed home, but there's a third son in the story, and the third son also left his father's house. And the third son is the son who's telling the story. Remember, it's Jesus who's speaking this parable. And he once left his father's house, not out of rebellion, but out of obedience. He, he didn't come into the world to waste his life on riotous living, but to give his life a ransom for many. He came not in rebellion, but in submission. He was utterly selfless. One wasted his life on his own pleasure. The other gave his life for the pleasure of the father. One broke the father's heart. The other brought joy to the father's heart. And so how wonderful it is to be reminded this morning of that son who came into this world. The son of man came to seek and to save that which was lost. And before we close this morning, I want to just read another verse from that 90 and the 9. It says, but none of the ransomed ever knew how deep were the waters crossed nor how dark was the night the Lord passed through ere he found his sheep that was lost. And we think of all the Lord Jesus endured to reach the lost sheep and to bring back the wayward prodigal sons. And so this morning, maybe I'm speaking to different ones. Maybe there's somebody who's already a prodigal in heart, even though you're still in your father's house. Don't think that you can go away from the father's house and have a different story. This story is true of every prodigal. They have to be brought to the end of themselves before they realize how good they had it in the father's house. And then maybe I'm speaking to somebody and you have a prodigal and you're concerned about them. Well, I hope that this has encouraged you this morning because this is a chapter about the God of the prodigals and the lengths that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are going to, to bring back that which was lost. And then maybe a little glimpse of the great joy in heaven over one sinner 
that repents. If somehow we could get a hold of the heart of the Father, maybe we'd have more zeal of reaching lost sinners with the gospel. And oh, what a wonderful thing it is to think of the Father scanning the horizon, just waiting, ready to run and embrace another prodigal and welcome them home again. Oh, what a God we serve. How worthy of worship he is, the God of the prodigals. And if you've got prodigals, don't give up. Don't lose heart. Pray for them. Yes, pray earnestly for them. But be reminded that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is on their case and wants to receive them back, willing to receive them back through the work of the shepherd that died and the spirit that through the word convicts. And working together in harmony, they are specialists at restoring prodigals. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray that somehow you would use your word this morning uh, to speak to hearts, Lord. You know the hearts that are about in your presence, those that are listening now and maybe will listen later. And Lord, we ask that you might use this uh, so that prodigals will be restored. And Lord, we're so grateful for those of us that once as prodigals we wandered. Uh, we, once we were far from thee, but we have been redeemed and restored and clothed in your righteousness. We have a new walk. Uh, we have a, a signet. We have an assurance that we're yours forever. Oh, how thankful we are for these blessings. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we give thanks. Amen.